Um, I want to start and tell you that when I began doing research on um, this wandering and elopement problem, and it's something that all of us face that are in skilled nursing facilities, I contacted about six different organizations, uh, both assisted living and long-term care, to ask them if they had had elopement, if this was something they experienced and they were worried about. And not one could tell me they had not had an elopement, and all said in most cases it had been relatively recent. But more interesting to me was when I went online and started pulling up articles about wandering and elopement, it took me a long time as I pulled up Google to get through all the ads that were put up by attorneys. And these items that you see from the newspaper were new, actual newspaper articles, but in many cases they were referred to by attorneys who are adv advocating to be um, representatives for families who have suffered loss uh, at the expense of an elopement or wandering issue. So I'm going to read these two to you in case you have trouble seeing them online. It said, um, an investigation into the death of a 93-year-old at a New York assisted facility acted improperly when they failed to report the man was missing from his room. That was an investigation. 85-year-old Edna May Slides managed to wander from Hillside Plaza Nursing Home without knowledge of the nursing home staff. On July 15th, Slide's body was found a short distance from the facility. Mind you, all of these are real, not meant to scare you, but to make it very real how important these issues are. More news stories. These came from television, and this was an 89-year-old Sarah Wentworth was a resident of the Arbors, a Chicago nursing home, when she walked out a door and into a wooded area. Hours later, the, fa the staff found Ms. Wentworth's dead body, and it was just a short distance away. In Ohio, an 87-year-old resident wandered from her facility into a nearby road where she was struck by a hit-and-run driver. What I want to say about this is, is not only does this involve um, the uh, cases of litigation for payment and penalties, but the state's attorney general also many times gets involved in these. In one case, talked about them evaluating evidence that was surrounding this care and to determine if criminal charges were warranted against the nursing home or the individual employees. So I think recognizing our responsibility and the ramifications of our actions are just incredibly important. But nothing, nothing is more important than the fear that is struck or the worst feeling that you can have when you recognize that you have a missing resident. This is true for families, it's true for caregivers, and it's true for organizations as well. And as I mentioned to you, there are different things that we can do to address the issues of wandering and elopement from a home that differ from that in a facility. And at another presentation, we will go over that with you, and I think it's very important that we do. So wandering is most often associated with dementia, and that's true, and there's no question, but 50% of individuals with dementia will wander. Of course, we know that folks that have um, Alzheimer's disease or related dementias have memory and recall deficits. They have higher anxiety that's associated with not knowing where they are. And I think all of you who work in facilities are aware of people who will constantly saying to you, what should I do? What are we going to do now? What do you want me to do? And so all of this tends to add to the anxiety and wandering behaviors. We know with cognition there's memory and recall deficits. I also want to mention to you the poor visual and spatial ability. Let me just finish up here and tell you that it is the visual cortex part of the brain that is affected, and this can happen in about one-third to one-half of the folks who have Alzheimer's disease. These individuals, what this affects is their three-dimensional capabilities of being able to visualize in a three-dimensional world. What that means is they can't map their way back to something because they have no mapping abilities. They can't talk and think about where they started and their ending. Of course, we know the disorientation that comes with this disease 
And then finally, this we'll see in different areas that we address today, but are the expressive language deficits, that they can't tell us what they need or where they want to go or why they're trying to get out of a facility. And so these are all things that are associated with dementia that lead to wandering. Definitions, definitions, definitions. Um, this was pretty impressive to me, how many different um, journals defined wandering differently. And uh, wandering has been studied by uh, numerous academicians, and they've broken down wandering into all types of subcategories and types of wandering. Uh, some of them, and I'm, these aren't the ones that I'm going to use exactly, but they're purposeful wandering, critical wandering, aimless wandering, exiting wandering, post-exiting wandering, but I really want to use the ones that came from a recent article that was produced April 8, 2009, from the American Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. And I thought this captured everything the most of what I've been able to see and I think what most people talk to me about. So these will be the definitions that we're going to cover. Um, when we got into um, these definitions for wandering, the first one that the, the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease discusses is excessive locomotion. And what does that mean for us exactly? What does excessive mean? In some cases, you have to realize this can mean all day long, nonstop, can't get the person to quiet down. In other types of excessive locomotion, it's saying that a person who is normal sedentary didn't do a lot of movement, is moving around a lot more than normal, more than they would have at home before their admission. And so it's what is normal for the person themselves that makes it excessive. There's actually no known reason for the locomoting, does so, so frequently and continuously over several hours. This can be in circular motions or it can be back and forth. And most of the literature will talk about that in excess of locomotion, if they're walking in circles or they're walking back and forth, that is dominated by the environment that they're in. If it's a circular environment, they may be able to walk freely in a circle or it may be a hallway that it's only back and forth. This locomotion actually interferes uh, with them attending activities. It interferes with them going to the bathroom because they don't stop. This can uh, result in excessive fatigue. We know that we've even seen problems with people's feet because they've walked too much, swelling in the ankles. Um, I would tell you that when they lose their way interiorly, uh, this can interrupt uh, numerous people uh, with uh, what's happening, like going into activity areas, that they don't know not to walk into that area. But more importantly with this type of wandering is the one um, I think that interferes with their ability to eat because they can't stop long enough to do that. Another uh, area for this is interfering with going into other residents' rooms. And I think all of us have been uh, through that where you find someone rummaging in someone else's room, getting into someone else's bed, all of this we could call purposeless activity or it could be very purposeful that they're trying to find something. They're trying, even if it's their own mind, that they are so confused. So all of this is called wandering. And um, we always don't think of that as wandering, going into someone else's room or um, if they're doing that pacing. They'll call it pacing, but this by definition is wandering. And losing one's way interior to care, that is where they're not finding the activity room, they can't find their way to the dining area, and need just predominant cueing over and over. What is the locomotion into off-limits or pro um, prohibited or hazardous areas? This can be something that is just going into other people's living quarters. It can be going into the kitchen. Um, this can be going into stairwells. Any type of area uh, within the facility that is an off-limit or prohibited, not just because it's, um, but because of safety, I think is the most important thing. We talk about um, locomotion at night, and people don't think about that as wandering, but somebody who gets up during the night and gets dressed and is ready for the day, in the literature, this is often referred to as another form of wandering. Whether it is aimless or purposeful, it is still a wandering activity. Why are we going through all of this? 
because every one of these activities can lead to what we're going to get to later into elopement or exiting the facility and going into harm's way. These may be precursors and things that we should be looking for to see if somebody is exhibiting these signs. Uh, when we talk about traveling unaccompanied beyond doors um, and inside the doors, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this. This is called exiting reference. And I think if there's something that we need to spend time on and really understand about this is we see this a lot and oftentimes fail to recognize that this is the precursor to elopement. What does this mean? It means that they're starting to leave. It may be that they're just saying, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave now. When are we going to leave? When is my family coming to get me? Uh, this is where they linger at the doors, test the doors. All of us know that there are some folks with dementia that can actually put in the code. They've watched it enough, and we don't think they have the cognitive ability to use the code, but watched enough, sometimes they can. Another exiting reference is putting on their coats, um, putting on a purse over their shoulder. Those are all references to the point that these folks are trying to exit the building or at least thinking about exiting, desiring to be away from where they're at. These are trigger symptoms. These are all signs that we should be looking at, care planning, putting into our service plans, and preparing and trying to prevent these folks. And we'll talk about those strategies in a minute. But I want you to be aware how often these activities occur that we don't think of that as wandering or an exit potential as long as they don't get out of the building. And that's not true. Um, I want to talk to you also that some people don't think about packing a suitcase is an exiting reference, another thing that is a um, trigger for wandering or eventually for elopement. We've even had somebody call a cab. Yes. Uh, and then removing identification bracelets, tags, anything else like that are called exiting reference. Um, seeking a means or an opportunity to exit is often seen with shadowing staff, family members when they get ready to leave through those doors. They're right there with them. And we know the folks that stay right by the doors. So those are exiting references. So... Then we come to exiting, which is simply put, unauthorized exiting, which means it's unsafe for this person to leave and something that we don't want them to do. If they're asking to go home, any of these other things, this is something that we're anticipating they will do. So most of us, this is our absolute um, um, greatest fear, and that is post-exiting or elopement. Going back to... Um, triggers of wandering and some of the interventions that we can take, I think this is one of the most interesting things that we have to think about. People who do this constant pacing or locomotion, going in circles, round and round and round, may be something that helps reduce their anxiety, may be very purposeful for them, but it also is a major calorie burner. And people can lose weight very quickly. Uh, quickly with this and we have to look at ways because they won't sit down and eat. So we have to get with the dietitian and with your kitchen to come up with food sources that these folks can walk and eat at the same time to make sure that they're getting the calories that they need. And there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing in the regs that say somebody cannot eat a sandwich on the go, that you can't hand them a chicken nugget as they walk around, that you can't hand them um, a cookie as they walk. We would like it to be nutritious food, but we know they also love sweets. And so as they're walking, there's no reason they can't be eating. I am going to mention to you that in a dementia facility, when people are walking and eating, it increases the chance for things falling on the floor and someone else slipping. So please make uh, sure that when you see people who are eating and walking that you're watching for that. You're still responsible to be following up after them and for the safety of everyone else as well. They talk about with the restlessness of walking, that if there is a continual path, do you have any items of interest or things that can get them to stop? That's going to be very individualized. What might stop one person won't stop another. 
but um, we had one person I know in a facility where I worked who used to play football, and just placing a football sometimes would get this person to stop and hold the ball. Very seldom did he throw it, but he would sit down and handle the football. A baseball glove, I wouldn't give a hard baseball, but a baseball glove sometimes of just handing somebody something as they're doing the pacing might get them to sit down and take the glove and put their fist in it, some different things like that. So we're always looking for ways, but it's going to be very, very individualized. Elopement, some things we should know. I think this is important. Mortality for those who elope rises dramatically after 24 hours. I have to tell you, this was in the literature everywhere, is that if somebody's gone for more than 24 hours, um, the chances of return, this is not like children. We know that those numbers go up. But let me tell you what happens in elopement. In these situations, because of the frailty of the people who are going out and their inability um, to seek help for themselves, um, their reasons for death are most often from drowning. We'll see this again in a few minutes. Um, hyperthermia, uh, when they live in hot areas or it's very warm outside. Hypothermia, when they're in colder areas of the country. Dehydration, which we know happens so quickly uh, in seniors. And then finally, highway death. Uh, and um, some of this I'm going to go over a little bit more with you, but I want you to be aware of what we do know. One thing we know for sure is that you can take all the precautions in the world and the interventions that you can make and elopement may still occur. I have worked with some of the finest facilities. I have consulted with, I think, some of the very best. And for all they have done, elopement has still occurred. So I think what we have to do is that we need to be ready for it. And we're going to talk about that, what to do if an elopement does occur. But elopement occurs most frequently during the first days, uh, two weeks after a person is admitted to a facility. And if you were in the room, I would say, why is that? And the reason is very clear. They're more disoriented because they're there, but even more importantly, it's because we don't know the residents yet. And we have to increase our observations of new residents and be aware that Every single resident, whether they have a previous history or not, is a potential elopement risk in our facilities. I want to say that this is true for those who are joining us from independent living facilities, assisted living. We don't always call it elopement when they've left the facility from an independent living. We'll say they wandered off. But the truth is they're into an elopement activity. They have left the facility. They are no longer safe, and we can't provide security for them until we find them. So elopement, uh, first days to weeks with any change. Um, I'm always concerned when we have new residents, do we have enough staffing to get these folks um, very comfortable, to cue them, to get them to their right rooms? Uh, to make them feel safe, and do we spend that kind of time with them? It's all of our responsibility from receptionists, activity coordinators, dietary, housekeeping. None of us can think this isn't our responsibility. Once somebody is entrusted to us, it doesn't matter what your position is, we're responsible for keeping them safe. So let's talk about elopement for a minute, and what should our response to elopement be? The first thing is, is that we have to have an immediate staff-initiated search of the facility and the premises. But you know what happens, and this is just unbelievable, but when somebody realizes somebody's gotten out of the building, everybody rushes to find them, and then we leave the other residents unattended or with not enough attention. Remember, do not leave the other residents unattended. Notification of a pre-specified roster of individuals who you're going to contact. This is really interesting. When we have a roster, we mean, do you call the DON, do you call the administrator, who gets called first? And it's very important that you have a list of that and one person who should be making those calls, not 15 people. We should be looking, one person calling in the folks from the organization that need to be notified. We need to know who is responsible for notifying law enforcement and the family and the physician. Is that a charged nurse? Is that an administrator? Is that somebody, the vice president of an organization? Do you already know who you want to have make those notifications? Do you know which local law enforcement agency to call right away? 
And for each of your facilities, you should contact your local police department and find out if there's someone else that you should be notifying as well as them. And then obtaining all the information that you're going to need to give law enforcement and search teams. Um, that includes what is the height, the weight of the person, do they have any physical, do they have any scarring, any tattoos, anything that would help them to identify this person. And you'll see why that's so important in just a minute. Um, I also want to say, because there are some family members who are watching this with us, and we have facilities that are inside neighborhoods, it's imperative to know that this isn't just calling the police department. You should be able to have a list of neighbors that you can call and friends that could help you and uh, have a way because the faster we find the person, the more likely we are to get them back safely. So utilize neighbors um, and friends. Um, you know, when I think about Twitter today, I think this is the greatest use for Twitter uh, for those people that we need to get back. Um, information that you're going to need. Oh my gosh, this one just drives me nuts. The photograph, a current photograph of the resident. Recently, I was in a facility and I said, okay, if we needed a photograph of the resident right now, could you get me a photograph? And they said, absolutely. And they came up to me with a copy of the Mars that had a photograph that was this big in black and white. And I have to tell you, I could barely discern who that person was that was used for medication administration. Those pictures need to be clear, but this one has to be even clearer. And you need to save the photographs, and it should be on a digital camera, uh, if at all possible, and you should save those for every resident that comes into your facility. And if a resident is admitted on a Friday, you can't take the photograph on Monday. Remember, if they're most likely to wander and elope during the first hours or days that they come into a facility, when do you think we're going to need the photograph for the police right away? This is it. So we want to photograph immediately of the resident. That should be part of the admission as they come in. If at all possible, we want to have a description of the clothing of the individual where they were last seen. And a lot of times you're going to hear this uh, P-O-L, uh, the point of location last seen is what they talk about. We want to know their height. Again, their weight, their identifying characteristics. Where were they last seen? Who was the person who last saw them? If previous attempts to wander attempted, were attempted, where did they go? Did they have a special place they went? Have you ever noticed in your facilities that when other residents have wandered off, they seem to have been found in a certain area? Those are all things that are going to be very helpful in your search. Do they have any medical conditions that law enforcement will need to know about should they find this person? Do we need to know something about the medications that they're on? Anything else that would be helpful if someone were to come across this person? Of all the things that I learned when I did some of this research, these were, this, I think, the most amazing to me. Dementia residents may simply wander into an area leaving absolutely no clues other than scent um, or uh, that's it, really, other than scent. They show no sign of passage through the area. When somebody who is not cognitively impaired recognizes they are lost, there is a tendency to start leaving things for people to find them. Or they will know that they're getting hot and will take off a jacket. Um, something else that they might do to make themselves more comfortable. They might have had something in their pocket to eat that they would drop something on the ground. In these cases, most people leave with no items or accoutrements on them, and they don't know to disrobe if they start to get hot. They're not going to take off their shirt. Um, so they don't leave any signs. The majority are found, oh, this is so sad, in drainage creeks or heavy brush or briars. And this is interesting because what you see here in this picture, and I hope you can see it well, is a path. They're saying in the literature from Search and Rescue, these people, when they get a vision to go out, they just go straight. They don't change. They don't know to take the path. They just keep going in the direction of which they're walking. Interesting study was done in Virginia. 
And it said that when people left facilities and they started to uh, get their way of where they were going to head, they most often headed towards the sun, wherever the sun was. So that was one clue that was used and often uh, in the start of a search and rescue. It's not 100% of the time, but more common than not. The reason they're found in the brush or briars is because once they start walking straight, they don't have the idea to try to go back and find a path. They just keep going through the brush and briars. Hiding is very common. I didn't understand this at first. I almost with children thought, well, they would think they were going to get in trouble if people were calling them. Some of the, the uh, significance of this was done in a study that was done up in um, uh, northern Virginia where they have many, many retired military personnel. And uh, they have a um, kind of, I guess you would say, a hypothesis that the reason they hide is that people go back to that time of when they were in war. And when they're out in the brush and this area, they're hiding because of that. I thought that was fascinating. So we have to look for hiding. Uh, we have to know the idea that they're not going to follow a path normally. So when you begin the search, they talk about putting out a search party and that do the walking the lines and they go through heavy brush and have to be prepared to do that. That's why sweep teams are most effective in recovery because they're not going to follow that path. They will walk that straight path until they can't walk or progress any farther and that is why they end up in creeks and drainage dish, uh, ditches. Um, most are found within one half to a mile, um, some as far as a two mile radius of the place they were last seen. And it's one of the reasons that search and recovery units every two hours go back to the areas that have already been done right in that one to two mile radius of an area uh, where the person was last seen. The more search uh, and rescue facts are that individuals will not respond to being called by their name. Uh, possibly a child, when you call, if they're not afraid of getting in trouble, will respond when they're called by name. Not so in folks with Alzheimer's disease that have wandered away from facilities. As a matter of fact, those numbers were very high that did not respond. I think they were almost none. Most individuals will not call out for help. And again, those numbers were very, very high. This one is shocking, that many of the individuals who have wandered into areas where people are uh, in, a, in a group, uh, large areas in a city, are thought to be homeless rather than being lost. And there were several articles of people who were homeless for days, seen by police, but were not picked up because rather than thinking they were lost or wandered away, they were homeless. We don't have very good statistics on how many people wander a year. I had a lot when I first started doing the study and I'd write them down. They kept changing. What I realized as I read more is that when somebody wanders away from home and the family is able to find them, they're not reported as an elopement. The only time that we're really seeing heavy elopement is when people have been put out on an amber alert, a search and rescue team, helicopters have been used, or for facilities that have had to report this when the person's been gone for a certain number of hours and you've had to report it to the state. So the numbers of people who are wandering in a way are very high, way higher than anything that we have um, done in studies. So it's something to think about. But I had not considered the homeless issue myself before. Age has absolutely no predictive value for survivability. Uh, it turned out that it was more the area they were in and what the temperatures were rather than their age. And utilizing dog teams and trackers may play the most critical role in locating an individual, and that's because of the scent. Um, very important that we recognize um, these facts that we just went over, that to go out screaming names and think they're going to be responding or calling for help if we're in an area are probably not going to work at all. If there's anything that we can do, it's one thing to talk about search and rescue, but let's go back to prevention for a minute. One are those care plans and service plans that we talked about. The next one is anticipating any resident that has the potential to wander and elope and then do something about it. And one of those is identification bracelets. 
it's uh, interesting that a lot of folks won't wear them. And I think um, this is a concern for many facilities. These can be just strictly medic uh, alerts that you can have the person's name put on them. On these, it says here what number to call and who the caregiver is on this. And I want to tell you that the Alzheimer's Society has um, – plenty of stuff that has to do with Wander Safe and these alert guards and things like that. But I also want to tell you that I was fascinated uh, when my daughter ran in a marathon that uh, we were advised to get one of these little plates that you put on her shoe, and it's laced on the shoes. And I thought that was fabulous because it was almost impossible to get them off. I bet they're still on her um, running shoes, to be honest with you. Um, and also on these you can put important medical information and the person is not always aware of them as long as they have their shoes on when they wander out of the facility. Uh, the other thing is on clothing, on every single piece of clothing is to put the person's name and a phone number. The name isn't going to make any difference. Uh, what we want is a, um, a contact number and if there's something that you need to sew in like diabetic, allergic to penicillin, something like that uh, until they can contact you. And we'll talk about a few other devices here as well. Facility elopement drills are imperative because they may never get out of the facility. They may stay right in your facility if you're able to do this effectively and quickly and to find the person before they wander far from the building or elope far enough away. People don't want to hear this, but sometimes you have to discharge a resident from a facility when you can no longer protect them. Somebody who is at wander risk and you do not have a secure facility and you're unable to meet the safety needs of that resident, you may need to discharge that resident from the facility so that they can find a facility where um, they can be more secure, that they um, might have wander areas outside that are secured. They might have different types of systems um, that can protect them. But it's a consideration you always have to have if you have someone um, that you cannot maintain their safety. Utilizing technology, we talked about that already, about your need to keep up with it, to make sure it's being used, that people are being responsive to it. But I think it's important for you to look into all the type of technology that is available. The most interesting to me that I've been reading about uh, is the uh, global positioning devices. Um, we have GPS on almost everything, and now there is GPS for residents who wander. It's not cheap. It's not overly expensive when you think about life, but it is definitely something we should discuss with families. It's something we should be thinking about as facilities, and I was really amazed at how good these are. Um, all the different types of alarm systems on doors, um, some of them in, are incredibly sophisticated, and some are amazingly simple. So I think that rather than spending a lot of time on it, I would encourage you uh, to go online and look at all the things that are available and then look at your budgets and um, think about uh, what the outcomes could be when you weigh that as well. If you'd like more information, I want to be able to help you to do that, and that is how to conduct an elopement drill, preparing and utilizing the appropriate service and care plans, how to perform a thorough pre-assessment, the frontline staff in-service training program for wandering and elopement, and environmental accommodations. This will be something that will be offered in our contact hour programs and I think will be of great use to you, but it's so hard in such a short period of time to cover such important information. Uh, what I would like to do is ask if we could switch over to the document camera for just a minute. Thanks. Uh, what you can see here is a, um, a kind of a map of a facility and all the surrounding area. And if you can think about, if you had to call in a group of people to look, you can even do this for a neighborhood. But if you want to divide this into grids of four, I think one of the greatest things that you can do is then put an overlay over this, just like one of the clear overlays we used to use on overhead projectors, or you can even use a sleeve and get one of those indelible markers and put who is out in each of those areas and a cell phone uh, that they have. Most people today have a cell phone so that you know who is in each quadrant of where you're looking and when they can come back and tell you exactly where they looked. 
there, when you begin to look at elopement drills, you're looking for every area inside a building where someone would hide, in stairwells, down in the maintenance areas, linen closets, places you would never expect residents to even get into, unlocked rooms, getting into every single room, um, locked rooms, because it's amazing that you think they were locked and um, then you find out, no, they were not. But utility rooms, all sorts of areas, because remember, once they start going, they'll go straight until they can't go further. And may, I hope what we come away with is that this is one of the most serious things that can happen to a family. It's uh, when you read the articles um, that are on Google, uh, I have to tell you that it is um, very emotional to know what families go through and the pain of losing someone they love to this. Um, especially when we work in facilities, they entrust those um, ones they love to us. It is our responsibility. We need to take it seriously. I think most of us do, but I think we can do even more. So I appreciate you joining us today. I look forward to seeing you for our next topic. Thanks very much, and take good care. Bye.